visiting with us. If you brought your Bible, please turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 15. Proverbs 15. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of a fool gushes folly. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on on the wicked and the good, a tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. The New Testament also has some things to tell us, especially in the book of James, about how important it is that we watch what we say we're careful about what we say. I remember seeing a proverb, not in the Bible, water and words, easy to pour, impossible to recover. This is something that all of us as Christians need to think about. We have it in the Old Testament and the New, admonitions about how we talk, what we say, particularly as it affects others. If you see a fire and throw a liquid on it, what will happen? Well, if the liquid is water, the fire has a good chance of being quenched. But if the liquid is gasoline, the fire will burn higher and hotter. A gentle word can quench the fires of anger. A harsh word makes the fires even hotter. So I come today with a word of advice from God's word. Consider your words carefully. And this is particularly true when someone has said something to you and you feel bad about it. It may be that your first reaction is anger. Incidentally, whenever you say, or whenever I say, he makes me mad. That's not true. Nobody can make you mad. Nobody can make you angry. Your anger comes from within. And today, if you find yourself angry with somebody, it's because you have generated that yourself. Nobody can make you angry. They can irritate you. They can insult you. They can ignore you. They can be apathetic towards you. They can mistreat you, but nobody can make you have any sort of a reaction that comes from within. So consider your words carefully. Let's say somebody has just said a harsh word to you. What do you do next? Well, I'm going to suggest some things. Number one, wait. Don't just respond immediately 
with no time in between what was just said to you and what you're about to say. Stop. What is it used to be on the railroad tracks? Stop, look, and listen. So stop, wait. Before you say what is you're about to say, think about it. I've always heard count to 10. And that doesn't mean 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It means deliberately count to 10. One, two. Of course, the person may just walk away by then. Well, that's all right. It's not a bad idea to count to 10, especially if what you're feeling is resentment and what you're about to say is harsh. Another thing that you might do is recite a scripture to yourself. This, these scriptures here in Proverbs are not bad ones to know. And they would be good ones to remember at that time. But any scripture will do. Or hum a hymn to yourself. We proved to this morning that we can do that. Hum a hymn in your head. And here's, here is the main thing that I'm suggesting you do. Visualize Jesus standing right there. Because he is, you know. Jesus is right here with us. Emmanuel, God with us. He sees, he hears, he knows. That in itself should guide us in what we choose to say. Once spoken, words take on a life of their own. They're no longer under our control. They're turned loose. And sometimes... They are unruly and unmanageable. I've never been to a horse race, but I've seen movies of horse races. And I remember seeing one one time of a horse that was taken to the starting gate, but he never would settle down. He kept kicking the gate. He kept whinnying. He kept moving around. Something was agitating him. And so instead of opening the gate and letting him run the race, they took him back to the stable. Might have been a, a really good idea because a horse is a very intelligent animal and if he's upset about something, somebody may get hurt. So before those words are turned loose, Think about it. Think about what you're going to say. Wait. Number one is wait. Number two, consider that you may have misunderstood what was just said. I know, I know that I have a pretty good chance of having misunderstood what was said because I don't hear half of what people say. But it may be that I heard every word perfectly, but I still misunderstand what this person is trying to tell me. And so I owe it to myself as well as that person to clarify what was just said before I reply. Number three, consider what has been said may have arisen 
from a misunderstanding on the part of the person speaking. I see that happening a lot, where a person says one thing and he means to say something else, or he could have said it in a better way to make it more easily understood. Whatever, there's a misunderstanding. And so it's important for the sake of our friendship for me to try to understand what was just said. Number four, ask the Lord for help and wisdom in speaking. We talk a lot. We come into this world usually with a cry, using our voice, expressing ourselves, and we keep doing that for the rest of our lives. We talk a lot. We need to ask the Lord for help and wisdom in what we say. This is particularly true of us as the children of God, because we bear the added responsibility of being representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. Number five, weigh what has been said on its own merit. Don't bring up stuff from yesterday or last week or next week. Let's just think about what was just said. That alone, all by itself. In every congregation in Texas, there are a lot of people who are cowboy fans. I'm sure that would be true today in this, in this vicinity. So imagine that you are a cowboy fan and your cowboys have been on a winning streak and all of a sudden you settle down with your popcorn and your Pepsi Cola and they lose 47 to nothing. Well, you saw the game, you read about it, and then you heard about it on the news. It's time to go to work the next day and your coworkers know that you're a cowboy fan and so they rub it in. Hey, the cowboy didn't do so well, did the last night? <laughs> and the boss even chimes in and ridicules you for being such a fan. Several customers know that you're a cowboy fan and they have their part to add to your misery. When you go home and get in the cab, the cab driver turns around and says, hey, I hear you're a cowboy fan. And you get home and the kids meet you and they say, Daddy, why did the cowboys lose last night? As you and your wife sit together waiting for the supper to be ready on the stove, she says, you married such a sweet woman. She looks over at you and she casually says in a sweet way, the cowboy's lost again, huh? <laughs> the next voice you hear is likely to be in reaction to what everybody said, everybody but her. Have you ever been in that experience where somebody reacted to something you said and you had no idea you were reflecting what others had said? So, rule number five is weigh what has been said on its own merit. Don't bring in what everybody else has said or what everybody else has done. 
Number six, expect somebody to get angry with you, criticize you, insult you, ridicule you sooner or later in life. I know you're a nice person, and people ought to treat you right. But life is what it is, and somewhere along the way, somebody is not going to like something you did or said. And so you're going to receive some criticism. Learn to expect that. That's the way life works. There isn't any reason to ruin your own day over what somebody else said. Number seven, give an honest answer to what was just said to you. Don't be holier than thou in it. Don't look, don't act like you're above all of this. But just be honest and fair in how you respond. Number eight, smile. It's amazing what a smile will do to you. And knowing that you're smiling at somebody lets them know that you're all right. And sort of takes the sting out of it. Number nine, finally, Try to say something humorous in the situation. Try to see something humorous in the situation. Now that doesn't mean to make, make a joke that's gonna make the other guy madder than ever, but it means that you look around and, and think about it, and maybe there's some lighter way to look at what's being said. Like the lady who did her washing, she washed sheets, a lot of sheets, hung them all out on the clothesline, and a dog came running through the yard with muddy feet, knocked the clothesline down and had a domino effect, and all the clotheslines got knocked down, all the streets were on the, all the sheets were on the ground, and the dog had walked on every one of them, and she laughed. And somebody said, what are you laughing at? She said, well, isn't it funny that he didn't miss one of them? <laughs> so what seems like might be impossible is possible after all. It all depends on us. So number one, think about what you're about to say. Number two, Consider what that harsh answer may, may do. You see, our text says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So consider what that harsh answer you're about to make may do to your relationship. Sometimes, because of what is said, friendships are broken up. I mean, long-time friendships. I remember in the first church I ever pastored, there were two men in the church that had a disagreement. They never, and I, I've maintained co contact with that community all through these years because I married my wife from that community. So I know about these particularly men, they, they had an argument that night. They never spoke to each other again as long as they lived. And they had been friends. So consider what this harsh answer may do. Consider the consequences. And consider the fact that sometimes what you say may hurt you more than anybody else. There was a guy in the Bible named Nabal, which means in the Hebrew language, fool. And he lived up to his name because 
David made a request of him, and David at the time was a fugitive with an army of hundreds of men going through the countryside, eliciting help from people for their sustenance because the king was trying to kill him. So David needed help, and he asked this man for help, and this man turned him down. Not only turned him down, but he had some choice words to say. Why should I give anything to this guy? Who is this guy David anyway? The result of that was that Nabal died. He died at David's hand. Now maybe nothing like that is going to happen to you, but the outcome of a harsh encounter is likely not to be good. So consider the, what's going to happen when you say what you're about to say and realize that it, even if it doesn't hurt you, it always hurts others. If, if what you're about to say is intended to hurt, it will. Shakespeare had a character who said, I will speak daggers to her, but use none. We have a saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Don't you believe it for one minute. Words do hurt. Words leave wounds that do not heal. And it starts fires that can spread. James said that the tongue is a fire of hell. Fire is really destructive. There, have you ever been to Chicago? If so, you know that there are signs in every public building about not smoking. And Everybody remembers the Chicago fire of 1871. It's a famous fire. And the rumor was that Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern, set the straw on fire, which set the barn on fire, which set the shed next to it on fire, which set the house next to it on fire, and it spread from block to block until... 100,000 people were homeless. It was a terrible fire. Can I chase the little rabbit here? Somebody said, don't smoke. Remember the Chicago fire. And some guy responded, don't spit. Remember the Johnstown flood. <laughs> Whew, I've got that out of my system, thank you. A fire is a terrible thing. James, James said that the tongue is like a fire. It starts something that it can't control. And then there's the experience of Rehoboam. You remember Rehoboam? Rehoboam was Solomon's son. And when, he, when Solomon died, the, the, the other tribes that were led by Jeroboam formed a, a representative group, and they went to the new king, Rehoboam, and asked, that their taxes be lowered because Solomon, in his quest to build all of these palaces and stuff, had taxed the people to the point where it was unbearable. And so Rehoboam asked his advisors what to do, and the older men said, tell them uh, that, you'll, that you'll help them out, that you'll lower the taxes some. You know what your father did was harsh. And the younger group of men said, now nah, tell them there's going to be twice as many taxes as there was before. And the result was rebellion. The result was a civil war. The result was a divided nation. From then on, it was, 
It was the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Never again was it as strong as it had been. The consequences of harsh words can be great. And so we need to be thoughtful in what we say. A little bit of hatred can spoil a score of years and blur the eyes that ought to smile with many needless tears. A little bit of thoughtless, thoughtlessness and anger for a day can rob a home of all its joy and drive happiness away. A little bit of shouting in a sharp and vicious tone can leave a sting that will be felt when many years have flown. Just one hasty minute of uncontrolled ill temper can offend and leave an inner injury that years may never mend. It takes no moral fiber to say harsh and bitter things. It doesn't call for courage to employ a lash that stings. For cruel words and bitter, any fool can think to say, but the hurt they leave behind them many years can't wipe away. Just a little bit of hatred robs a home of all delight and leaves a winding trail of wrong that time may never right. For only those who are happy and keep their peace of mind who guard themselves from hatreds and words that are unkind. So consider what the harsh answer may do. And then consider what the gentle answer, the soft answer may do. Again, in our text, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The soft answer, the gentle answer, the thoughtful answer, gives a true victory over our own spirit. We can walk away from the conversation knowing that we, in God's, with God's help and by God's grace, have conquered something evil. We've won the battle. The soft answer gives a worthy victory over the one who provoked you. That's what the New Testament teaches us to do. It teaches us to conquer through love. Jesus even took it further than that. He said, turn the other cheek, go the second mile. Every harsh encounter involves other people, the friends of each other. And we can see that in the Bible. We can see times when all of a sudden what started out as two people involve relatives and involve friends. And first thing you know, you've got two tribes of discontent. So remember, you have some influence and act in accordance with the will and purpose of our Lord. Here's what the scripture says about Jesus, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. And it allows the Holy Spirit to produce his fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those words describe the fruit of the Spirit. They describe the Christian life. They describe our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A lot is involved in what we say, so before we speak, Let's be sure we're speaking in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. We mutter and sputter, we fume and we spurt, we mumble and grumble, our feelings get hurt. We fume and we fluster, we fret and we shout, we worry and bluster, our patience gives out. We can't understand things, our vision grows dim when all that we need is a moment with him. 
Let's pray together. In a moment, we're going to sing, and as we sing, it is a time of invitation. You're invited to make a decision for the Lord. It may be that that decision is to accept Christ as your personal Savior. It could be that the decision is to rededicate your life to Christ or to join the church, or to answer his call to service, or something else entirely. If this is the decision that you're making today, and it's something that should be shared with the church, I'll be standing here at the front waiting to talk with you and to pray with you about it as we sing together. Heavenly Father, we pray that decisions for Jesus will be made as your Holy Spirit works within our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.